Pastor Michael Berry needs no introduction. Uh, we're very honored to have you come. Thank you so much for coming. And as you know, uh, this is the first of uh, five lectures uh, Sir Michael will be giving on super oscillations. You can see the schedule in any of these posters that we have. Um, and then he's giving a six, believe it or not, a six lecture on, uh, on resurgence and so on and so forth. One quick note on a technical engineering note here about this room. If you'd like to ask a question, we uh, ask if you could use your microphone. And all you have to do is hit speak. And the little red light comes on. And you can talk to us. And after you're done, I recommend you turn it off. Otherwise, everybody will hear all the private things you are discussing. So that's really the only instructions. And um, thank you, uh, Sir Michael. Well, thank you. So I've been asked to give these uh, five lectures on super oscillations and related matters. I did expect that in the audience I would have opposition, hostility, skepticism <laughs> from Yakir Aharonov and Sandu Popescu. But Sandu cancelled his visit here, which was only going to be for a weekend anyway, and Yakir will learn nothing from this first lecture and, and he's not here, so I'm free to say anything I like. Okay. So, I, so I'll tell you, uh, this is going to be, first lecture is going to be very relaxed. Um, there will be a gently rising level of technicality in these lectures. It won't be monotonic, uh, but the, this first one, as I say, will be rather elementary, although I am trying to include in every one of the lectures, more as time proceeds, um, material that some of the local experts might not know, as well as very elementary things that you will certainly know. Now, let me tell you how this started for me. Uh, in uh, 1990, just after I'd met Yakir, I met him in Israel in 1989, of course, his work was known because the Aronoff bohm effect was uh, uh, discovered in Bristol before my time there. In fact, I was a, um, at that time, a schoolboy applying to universities, and Bristol turned me down that year. But um, uh, Yakir's name was known, and I'd met him, and we got along because there's this connection with the geometric phase, which won't be part of this series of talks at all. Anyway, we got along very well, and so I invited him to Bristol, and he spent a week. Uh, um, in my house, actually, every morning he would uh, go for long walks. He, he, he had remembered Bristol 30 years before, and he said he wanted to go on these long walks to remind himself of the places gradually. The real reason was that he could smoke, actually. <laughs> anyway, he did. And then he told me something. It was before I realized his love of paradoxes. Okay, so uh, what he said was that... Um, he could envisage a, uh, a box containing only red light. And he would open uh, something, a wall in the, a door in the box, and out would come a gamma ray. I thought that was puzzling. It sounded to me like nonsense, actually. And uh, we talked about many, many things. This was just one thing. And it was just a couple of years after he had started publishing papers on what we now call weak measurement and super oscillations. So I didn't think much about it, but then a, a few years later, I did think about it, and I realized that underlying it is very interesting mathematics and also physics. And that was the beginning of my involvement with this subject. Now, what I didn't realize, and it's a curious thing, was that actually I had known about this idea in a sense in a different part of my head in the 1970s. And I'll speak about that connection on Monday. But for the moment, this was uh, following Yakir's uh, visit. And uh, I wrote this uh, paper in which was mentioned this quotation. I said Yakir was deep and quick and subtle, which I thought and still think, uh, and another paper uh, in um, 1994. Then my interest in this waxed and waned and waxed and waned and and uh, uh, I'm going to take you through, not in a historical order, that's not interesting anymore, but in the subject as I see it now. And I'm starting, as I said, in a very, very elementary way. And please forgive me, I don't want you to feel insulted by being 
treated to something extremely elementary, but I think it's important to understand the structure of these concepts. So this is all about functions that oscillate faster than they should. Now what does should mean? Well, you have a band-limited function, here it is, and it has, um, I mean, there are two screens, but it's not in stereo, you should know, just so you look at your pre preferred one, um, which has uh, limits, they needn't be plus and minus each other, but let them be. And then the, traditionally, you would think that the conventionally, the fastest variation would be the exponential corresponding to the largest or small Fourier component. Well, the whole of super oscillation theory is based on this at first counterintuitive idea that these functions can oscillate arbitrarily faster than their fastest Fourier component over arbitrarily long intervals, and this we call super oscillation. And there's a lot of interesting mathematics, as you well know here, and there are implications in uh, optics, in quantum physics, in signal processing, which I'll speak about as these talks develop. So let me begin with a very rudimentary recipe for super oscillation. Really, really, really elementary. Imagine this function, 1 plus cos x. Well, there it is. It's, of course, band limited. Indeed, it only has three Fourier components, 0, plus 1, and minus 1. OK, and there they are. The cosine divides up. Now uh, subtract epsilon squared. You haven't changed the Fourier content. You've still got uh, 0, 1, and minus 1. But now the function has little close-lying pairs of zeros, in fact, separated by epsilon. Now imagine that you only could see this little part of the function that's enclosed here. You might be tempted to think that this function, with its close-lying zeros, actually has a much higher Fourier content than it really does. You would just see this little part of a function, and oh, it's oscillating fast. It's, uh, it, uh, it has this uh, high Fourier content. Well, super oscillation theory magnifies this phenomenon. You could clearly envisage, and some papers actually implement, making more and more um, uh, zeros come close together by various judicious uh, additions of, uh, um, uh, of, of cosines and constants. And uh, then you would even more, if you saw a string of these zeros, think that you were looking at a function with a larger Fourier content, and it would not be true. Now, of course, the first thing some physicists say when I describe these super oscillations, and you will have encountered this comment yourself, doesn't this violate the uncertainty principle? Well, it doesn't, because the function is exponentially small um, where this happens. And the, the uncertainty principle is a crude thing. It's to do with variances. And it, it's blind to very small features, for example, exponentially small as they're going to be. So there's no, there isn't a paradox, but the one nevertheless has to speak about it. OK, this is my rudimentary infantile example. Now comes an example which people here in Chapman uh, know very well, and which will keep returning and keep returning uh, in, in these lectures. And uh, this is uh, what I first encountered with Sandu Popescu, but in fact it goes back before to uh, papers of Yakir. It's been very much studied uh, here. And this is the way I want to write it. You have a function of x. And you have a large parameter n, integer, let's say, even, 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 it's simpler, it doesn't matter. And this number a, which is greater than 1. So it's cos x over n plus i a sin x over n to the power n. a is greater than 1, n is much greater than 1. This is a periodic function with period n pi. Pi, not 2 pi, I'm thinking of n being even, it doesn't actually matter. Right, now let's ask, what does this function do near the origin? n is large, remember. Okay. The cosine is 1, and the sine is x over n, and the function is e to the n times the logarithm of this thing in brackets, which is 1 plus a times x over n. Well, logarithm of 1 plus something small is exponential by ax. So this is an oscillation with a wave number a, which is greater than 1. However, this is a periodic function that you can expand. It has a Fourier series with these uh, 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 Fourier um, uh, multipliers, c content Km, Fourier components, they're all less than 1, as you can see immediately if you expand this out. So here we are seeing a function which near the origin oscillates faster, a is greater than 1, than its fastest Fourier components. And these Fourier components actually um, 
are uh, all smaller than a. They're all smaller than 1, actually. 1 minus 2m over n. m goes from 0 to n. So minor negative ones and positive ones. There they are. So these are super oscillations with a factor a faster than normal oscillations. Now this function is worth understanding a bit better. Let's look at these Fourier components. Here they are. The details don't matter, but I want to draw attention to the fact that they alternate in sign, which means that when you want to understand this function as a Fourier series, you must uh, consider that uh, these different components, especially where x is small, interfere destructively with each other. And super oscillations generally are a consequence of almost complete extreme destructive interference. We'll see time after time examples of that. I shall say it many times. OK. Well, um, here's the function again. And let's, how would you characterize the local oscillations? One way, which I'll speak about a great deal more today, is through the local rate of change of phase argument of f of x d by dx of it, the gradient of phase, take a plane wave, because it's obvious, uh, e to the i kx, the phase is kx, gradient is just k. Okay, so you can do the calculation, it's not difficult, there it is, and you can plot it out. I've chosen a equals 4. Good. Well, um, this re the region of x over half a period, right. So this is the region of super oscillations, because this k of x is bigger than 1, which is the largest k in the superposition. Very good. Uh, then there's a region of normal oscillations. Then there's a region of sub-oscillations, where it's oscillating more slowly. Nothing surprising about a function oscillating more slowly than its fastest Fourier component. That just depends on how big the amplitudes are. No problem there. But this is the region where interesting things uh, happen. Good. Let's look at the function. Now, it's going to vary by enormous amounts. So take the logarithm, and it's helpful to take the real part to see the oscillations. So you don't always have to, have to look at the phase. And uh, the modulus of the real part, so the logarithm is, uh, uh, is never negative. Well, the oscillations are, are encoded in the zeros of this real part, or imaginary part, looks much the same. And uh, uh, logarithm of zero is minus infinity. So these lines are the, uh, are the uh, give you the zeros. So this depicts the oscillations of the function. Now this um, little arrow, double-headed arrow, this is the oscillation wavelength of the largest Fourier component where naively you would think the function isn't oscillating faster. Well, a is 4 here, so it's oscillating 4 times faster. And n is uh, 20 or so, I don't remember exactly. Good. I do. The number of super oscillations is of order n before the function starts to oscillate uh, in ways that you would naively expect from its Fourier content. OK, now let's look at the modulus of the function. Here it is, modulus, and it's some function there, quite a simple thing to calculate. When x equals is near 0, it's 1, 1 to the power. When x halfway through its cycle, when x is a half n pi, it's 1 plus a squared to the n over 2, which is enormously large. Remember, a is greater than 1, n is big. So the super oscillations are, as I've said and will say repeatedly, exponentially relatively small. Exponentially e to the minus uh, roughly n over 2 log of this thing, 1 plus a squared. Very good. Well, here's a graph of the modulus of the function. I think n is 20 there, a is 4 again goes from 0 to 10 to the 12, and you don't see anything in here. So let's look at the logarithm of the modulus. And now you see that this function is anti-Gaussian. That will play a role later, actually, in a subsequent talk. But here is a region of super oscillations. You don't see those in the modulus. Sometimes you do. I'll show an example of that uh, um, on, on Monday. But uh, you don't have to. It's usually the phase. But So here you see this um, very small region, exponentially small region. Very good. Again, near-perfect destructive interference. Now, if you look at the power spectrum of the function, which is ignoring these uh, alternating signs, there's no hint of the super oscillations. You've got a little bit of asymptotics on these factorials and the like. And uh, uh, to a very good approximation, the function is Gaussian. It can't be completely Gaussian because it's band-limited. But to a very good approximation, it is. So, for example, um, um, the, uh, the, the, these points are the 
exact values of the power spectrum. You calculate the square of the coefficients at these uh, uh, integer related values at which the Fourier components exist. It's a discrete spectrum. And of course, it's exactly zero uh, outside this range, minus one to one. But it's very well approximated by this Gaussian, which is centered on one over A, which is less than one. So that makes it look like a normal Fourier series. The width of the Gaussian is one over the square root of N, and there it is. So there's no hint here that uh, you'd see structure in the function k equals a. In this case, a is a quarter. So one over, one over a is a quarter, a is four. So way out here, it is as though there's a component in the spectrum. Now, what the meaning of as though is, I will discuss a little bit more later today. But the, in Fourier terms, I'm calling this a super shift. And this, when we come to the physics in a subsequent lecture, this will be the shift of a pointer in a weak measurement. We'll get to that later. Now, here's comments that I used to make long ago. Imagine that you're an engineer uh, of a function of time, and, uh, and you have a filter. You have uh, a low-pass filter, an exact perfect low-pass filter. So nothing can pass through uh, which has higher than a certain frequency. But imagine that your signal that comes out, which is band limited, it must be limited by that frequency, is super oscillatory. Uh, you see some oscillation that look faster in time. Every engineer, acoustic engineer, before this uh, would believe the reason is their filter is leaky. But it need not be. It could be perfectly um, the perfect filter, but the bit of the function that they happen to see could be super oscillatory. And there's an illustration of that, which I gave long ago. I got it, uh, I, I developed in detail, but I learned it from one of the um, signal processing papers before. Um, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Suppose you want to reproduce that. Lasts for about an hour, and hi-fi, 20 kilohertz, let's say. You could reproduce that with a one hertz bandwidth signal. Sounds ridiculous. Indeed it is, because after the Beethoven, the one hour, the signal would rise to e to the 10 to the 19 times its intensity during the... So you never could, of course, achieve such a huge degree of super oscillation. But still, in principle, and in one of my old papers, I actually have b of x, Beethoven equals, b of t equals, and there's a formula um, which uh, gives this Beethoven's real Beethoven and b prime of x to the 1 hertz bandwidth version, depending on b of x sampled, and outside it rises to these huge values. We'll see this happening in many examples over the days. Um, now let's think of super oscillation as a function of position. It could be x, it could be xy, it could be xyz, doesn't matter. Okay, and the problem is to define a local wave vector. And we want to describe it in a way which describes the local variations of the function. Super oscillatory, generalizing what I described with the function of x. And then, of course, corresponding to this local wave vector would be a local momentum. Okay, multiplied by h bar, if you think of quantum physics. Now, of course, you do have the Fourier transform, the Fourier representation, the momentum representation of its physics, which is just this integral. And the trouble is that although this gives information about k, it's not tied to position. And of course, that in a sense, reflects the uncertainty principle. Nevertheless, there are at least five different ways in which you can construct a local wave vector based on different insights from mathematics, uh, physics, optics. But they all lead to the same value for this local momentum. And I wrote a pedagogical paper a, a couple of years ago, which I called Five Momenta, about this. So let me tell you the five ways. Well, one way I've mentioned already is the local phase gradient. We have a complex function. Here's a function with two zeros. Um, uh, it's made of a superposition of plane waves. I don't remember what it was. Uh, five or six of them, I don't know. Each of them have the same wave number, k0. So monochromatic waves. Uh, these colors represent the, the phase. And the phase curves are these um, red lines. They spray out here, these two zeros here. and. Uh, the lines perpendicular to them are the lines of phase gradient. So the wave fronts of this thing, where the phase is constant, are the red 
curves. I shall speak a great deal more about this type of uh, 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 physics where this occurs in optics on Monday, but just to show an illustration now. And so these gradient lines are the lines with these vectors which I show you. So what is it? This is the phase definition of, uh, of uh, local momentum, and it's the gradient of the phase, gradient of the imaginary part of the logarithm. Good, that's the first one. And the super oscillations are places in this uh, domain where the local um, wave vector has a length greater than the k0, which is in the superposition. OK, so that's one kind of phase momentum. Another one, local current. The momentum current out of a surface in a scalar wave, think of it in quantum mechanics, is the integral over the surface of the imaginary part of psi star grad psi. That's the quantum mechanical current. So a local momentum density, a current, can be defined as the quantity that's inside here. Right. Now, this occurs elsewhere in physics, not just quantum mechanics. Suppose you've got uh, vector light traveling almost in the same direction, paraxial beams, and you ask about the orbital part of the pointing vector. Uh, well, it's a vector wave. You split the electric field into the left and right-handed helicity components, and this part of the pointing vector is indeed the imaginary part of psi star grad psi for each of the two components added together. If you have a general uh, uh, electromagnetic wave varying arbitrarily in three dimensions, there's a similar formula, I won't go into it, involving the magnetic as well as the electric field, formula a bit like this, but where you have to take the average of the formula with the electric and the formula with the magnetic. It's called electric magnetic de democracy. But anyway, this quantity appears all the time, phase gradient of something. So a natural definition of local momentum is local momentum density divided by density. Well, there it is, and that's exactly the same as the first gradient of phase of the wave that we started from. So that's the second one. The third one, a local expectation value of the momentum. Now for any operator in quantum mechanics, the usual expectation value is the uh, scalar product of the inner state psi, of, uh, uh, of, of, of the state psi with the vector, um, uh, with the operator super, uh, sandwich between. It's a scalar product. Um, well, how might you define, well, this is a state whose position representation is a function psi of r. Now, how would you define a, a local expectation value? Well, here's a way to do it. It's a very natural way. You take your operator, but you multiply it by a delta function of the position where you are minus the position operator. You have to symmetrize. You want to make sure you've got a, a self-adjoined operator, and then you again normalize. That's very natural. And... Uh, we will apply this to momentum. I suspect many people have invented this way of looking at a local expectation. I wrote about it 40 years ago in a context, and I've discovered that it actually first appeared in a paper by Landau, published two months after I was born. Um, so if you now apply this to momentum, uh, and, and, and here it is, momentum operator, um, do take the uh, half of the, the symmetrized uh, um, the product with the delta functions, you work that out and it's exactly the same as the other two. Once again, the gradient of phase, okay? That's the third one. The fourth one is, and we'll discuss this physics in much more later, it's what we call the weak momentum with position post-selected. Let's come, let me explain that. There is something called, and come to it in later lectures, the weak value of an operator in a state psi pre-selected but where you post-select um, a state phi. This was the heart of uh, Yakir's um, formulation. And it's this thing. It's the real part, and by the way, there's an imaginary part which will come in another lecture, of uh, this, m this um, matrix uh, uh, element of A between psi and phi divided by the overlap. And uh, if you apply that to momentum, and you post-select position, here you are. Well, once again, that's the same as the other three definitions. So we've now got four seemingly physically different, but all the same ways of thinking of the same quantity, this local phase gradient or momentum, whatever. And the last one I want to talk about is this local Wigner average. 
Now, what's that? There is a way of representing quantum states in position and momentum simultaneously without violating any, any, um, uh, anything fundamental. And the Wigner function for a state psi, psi of r, in, I'm writing it for d space dimensions, is this. It's the integral over position of psi star of r plus r, psi of mi r minus r. That's the small r dependence. But this factor, e to the i, k dot integration position variable, um, and here's the k dependence. This is a function of r and k. It doesn't look symmetrical, but actually it is, because you can write it as the expectation value in your state psi of a delta function in phase space. This x is r and k, and this is the r and k operator. You have to define the delta function using its integral representation, where up in the exponent, you've got a democratic uh, combination of the r and the p. It's a precise way to do it, no, and it's exactly equivalent. So it is symmetrical, actually. It's a very nice projection of, of something. Now, um, OK. Well, um, by the way, it has, a, has these properties, you may know. This Wigner function has a property. If you project it along k, you get the local probability density in position space. If you project it along position, you get the local um, uh, momentum space density. So it's very convenient properties that it has. Um, now, you could then define the local Wigner momentum as choosing a position r, fixing r, but taking the average of the wave vector k. So you have to, of course, normalize it. And when you work that out, using all of this, it's a nice exercise, you get it's the same as the other four. So you've got five different momenta. I want to illustrate this Wigner a, bit, a little bit with some slightly unfamiliar examples. And at the end of this uh, uh, today's talk, I'm going to say something more fundamental about this Wigner way of uh, looking at uh, things. So let's, uh, here we are, sorry, here we are again. Now, let, let's take, a, again, one of these examples from optics, which is a, uh, an M vortex beam, e to the i m phi, Gaussian, and uh, this is a cross-section of something that solves the paraxial wave equation in two dimensions. Well, it, it makes nice pictures. You can look at the intensity which, from two different views. Uh, it's, of course, Gaussian outside, but with a zero, a strong mth order zero in the beginning. And I've color-coded the phase, it's e to the i m phi. In this case, colors vary three times as you go round from red to red by a blue. That's 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi. OK, and so this is the function, OK. And the local momentum of this function, OK, you can calculate it. It's m. It's azimuthally directed. You can see the gradient of phase is azimuthal. Of course, you see it from there. This is all real. And uh, so here are the lines. They're circles. And uh, this local momentum gets bigger as you approach this uh, zero, fundamental, as we'll discuss in great detail on Monday. Um, and so in, it can be arbitrarily large when you're very close. Of course, exponential of e to the i m phi changes by m 2 pi as you go round. So the closer you are, the faster the phase has to vary to achieve that. That's super oscillations, of course. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, of course, to compensate, as I have explained already, the function is very small there. It's r to the power m. Very good. This is the function. Now. Um, the Wigner function, you can calculate it analytically. I didn't see this anywhere, but it's probably known. Um, it's a function of position and momentum. It's a Laguerre polynomial of, involves the momentum and the position, the momentum and the position. It looks very unsymmetrical. This part is not, of course. It's r squared plus k. This is actually not unsymmetrical. It's an interesting object, vectorially. You can write it in different ways in terms of the, the k and the r, but it's actually symmetrical despite appearances. So let's, let's look at some. Um, well, here it is. This is for m equals 4. And I've shown the Wigner function of x and y, where the k is along the x-axis for different values. And uh, well, you've got a function. There's no clue, no hint here, that the function has super oscillations. Come back to that in a minute. OK. Now let me, let's look at a, 
a random function. I mean, a function sum of plane waves with no particular relations between their between their um, uh, uh, between their components. Um, here's such a function with four wave vectors, and uh, uh, I've again I've drawn vertically the modulus and color coded with the phase. It has three um, zeros here. Um, well. Uh, in the Wigner function corresponding to that, you can work it out. It's got uh, a part that's sort of diagonal. It just involves the Fourier components that are here. K. I should have put K n here. No, no, K. Sorry, no, no. I've, I've just used a different notation. I've labelled the k's by n. Um, so here's the function. There's a part that's only k dependent. Then there's a part that depends on k's and position. Now. Four wave vectors, I've drawn them here, this value and this value, three and four. And uh, here you see the mean values, which are these red dots. You see the differences, which are these lines. Now, each one of these contributions is a little plane wave. Um, there it is. And there's no hint here that the function is ever super oscillatory, which it is near these uh, zeros. So once again, it's not at all obvious. We'll come back to where the super oscillations are in the Wigner function later on. So here we have these five different wave vectors anyway, the phase one, the current one, the local operator one, the weak value, and the Wigner one. So they're all the same, different looking formulas. Okay, here's another example which I suppose if I'd been more logical I would have included this uh, uh, near the beginning, but let me show you. Two interfering waves. E to the ix, wave going one way, e to the minus ix going the other way, with a this one has a strength A, and I'm thinking of A as being positive. I don't have to, but I, I am. Well, again, the local wave vector, there it is. And you can see that it's A is less than 1, it's always positive. It, it's always in the direction of the dominant uh, exponential here. If there are more exponentials, this needn't be the case. I shall tell you in a later lecture about how you can have waves which are all going forwards, only positive uh, positive uh, wave uh, number, but where if you look at the local wave vector, it can sometimes point backwards. That's called backflow. Not today. So anyway, here we are. And uh, here's the function of x for different values of a. And I've shaded the super oscillatory regions where the local wave vector function of it, is greater than 1 to do with this denominator. So here we are. Um, uh, when A is very small, it's, this is a small perturbation, the backwards wave of the forwards one, and you've got these regions of modest super oscillation um, there. The mean value, by the way, of this, if you can, you can calculate it, is just exactly one. It's the dominant uh, exponential. So here's point 0.5, and now you begin to see there are rather large values of super oscillation, but in small regions, point 0.8, point 0.9. Now here, the wave function is almost real. This is almost twice cos x. The real function, of course, you can't define the phase. Uh, but still, when it's almost real, not quite, you get these huge super oscillations. Of one is down here. Uh, you can't see the scale. This is 20 and over these very narrow regions. So an interesting example of super oscillations. While we're on this subject, let's look at another one. Take reflection from a refracting slab. That's like a quantum square well with incident wave number k. So this is the refractive index. If this were quantum mechanics, the same picture would have a potential well going down like this. It's the same thing. So you have a wave coming in. You get reflections. You get transmissions. And uh, I've drawn this is the reflection coefficient as a function of refractive index. And I happen to have chosen k equals 2. It doesn't matter. Now, let's look at this picture again. And let's look at the local wave number as a function inside and outside this uh, potential well or refracting slab uh, for different, um, uh, different values of refractive index. So here's a value where you get almost no reflection. It's a transmission resonance. The one is way down here. And of course, the transmitted wave is just a single wave with local wave uh, vector k. And so that never super oscillates. That's just the one. But inside the barrier, inside the well, excuse me, you get all kinds of uh, uh, resonant behavior as a function of x, where the local super um, 
where you can locally super oscillate. Uh, that's super oscillations are where the length of k is greater than two, not one, because I've chosen k equals two here. Here's a case. Now this one here, where you get rather strong reflections. Well, now the wave there's a wave forwards and backwards in the incidence region. That's almost a real wave, like I showed a moment ago, and, and you get these rather large super oscillations. And here's an example where the index is zero. It's a very special case. And once again, you get these strong super oscillations now just in the, in the reflected region. So it's a game you can play, all kinds of waves, lots of simple examples, familiar examples you learn in quantum mechanics, but looked at in a slightly unusual way, looking at the local rate of change of phase. And uh, then you can identify super oscillations very easily, and they're surprisingly common. How common? is a question we'll address in a later lecture when we look at statistics and therefore we can understand typicality, which is another theme, but that will come. Okay, now, um, finally today, I want to, um, yeah, good. I want, I want to speak about, um, I come back to these Wigner functions, I want to understand, in what sense does this uh, local Fourier transform have a value outside the spectrum. Um, I've already talked about this local wave um, number, but I want to speak a little bit more carefully, because there are ways, a number of ways, in quantum physics, in optics, in signal processing theory, of representing local Fourier transforms of functions. And uh, so this is the work I did with Mo Nimrod Moiseev a couple of years ago. And the point of it is that to two of these functions, one is the Wigner function, one is the Husimi function, they are rather similar to each other, but they give completely different explanations of uh, the super oscillations that occur in the function. Completely different. It's rather a surprising thing. I was surprised to discover this. So here we are. Again, we have a band-limited function, the band here being k0, let's say. OK. And again, we have the local wave number. We've discussed that at great length already, graded to phase. And the super oscillations are where the local wave number is greater than the highest component of the superposition. So here's the Wigner function. I've written it now in this one-dimensional form. And I've written it in a way that shows the symmetry of it. You can write it as an integral over position or over momentum. And the functions look the same apart from a sign here, but they're exactly the same function. You substitute the Fourier transform here, you get back um, the, um, the local, uh, the position-dependent version. So there's the version. Now here's the point. As a function of k, this Wigner function inherits any band-limitedness there is in f of x. And we're talking about functions which in the position variable are band-limited. It's a little, you can see it if you think about it a little bit more. So if you write it in this representation, here it is, you have the band limits of, uh, of k. Of course, you must have them. But then you find that uh, this, as a function of k in, in the Wigner, it's also band limited. So you've got a band limited function. OK. Now, I told you that the local wave number is this Wigner average. You take the Wigner function. If you think of it as a probability distribution, well, you take the average over k and you normalize it. And when you first encounter this, it's a very surprising thing, because how can the average of something over some distribution lie outside the range? Well, the reason is, and this is truly fundamental in quantum mechanics, uh, how the band-limited function can have an average outside, it is, of course, that the Wigner function, although real, need not be positive. Indeed, it's negative precisely in the regions where x is super oscillatory. When you learn about Wigner functions in quantum mechanics as a way of representing a quantum state in what looks like a classical phase space as a distribution, you are told, you learn, and it should be emphasized, it isn't really a probability density because it can be negative. And that negativity is fundamentally related to places where you have interference. So this is consistent. Um, uh, here's a simple example. I mean, you know, uh, forgive my ignorance, but I was just, I hadn't realized that you could take an average of something over a range and get something outside the range. Uh, well, here you can. Imagine a function that only exists at 0 and 1 with these strengths, a and 1 minus a. Well, the mean value of, uh, the, the, mean value of the function, x in this case, it's k there, is 1 minus a. Um, 
which uh, exceeds one. It's super oscillatory if, uh, if A is negative. So you can have, easily have uh, um, averages outside the range if you forget that probability densities have to be positive. So uh, interference. Now here's the same example again. Two plane waves. I've now changed the sign. Um, forgive me for that. Two plane waves with one with the strength, one and one with the strength A. Now let's look at it Wigner-wise. And uh, so here the K0 is 1. Uh, it only has two Fourier components. Um, once again, I've showed you pictures like this already. This is the, um, this is the local wave uh, number, and it super oscillates somewhere. Now, the Wigner function has three components, at 1, at minus 1, and also at 0, because it's a quadratic thing. OK, well, what is the Wigner function? It only has a function of x and k. There are only three values of k uh, where it exists. And here, are, here exactly, this is the complete Wigner function. Um, and here you see this is positive, minus 1, plus 1 is positive. But at 0, it can be negative in regions where x is greater than pi on 4, or less than pi on 4, periodized. And these are indeed the uh, regions of super oscillation. So, um, Everything is consistent. Negative values of the Wigner function, means it's not really a probability distribution, um, correspond to, um, correspond to uh, super oscillations. OK. Now, here's another way of representing quantum states or functions in position momentum space or in time frequency space if it's signal processing. This is a Husimi function. Now, that's a Gaussian windowed Fourier transform the square of it. So you take the function, you Fourier transform it uh, uh, with a Gaussian uh, window uh, with width L. There it is. So it's a windowed Fourier transform squared. So it's always positive, not like Wigner. Now, you can think of this in another way. Same thing. It's the overlap between your function and a coherent state squeezed by L. Coherent state, here it is centered on the x and k that you're looking at in the phase space. It's the same thing, another interpretation. It's the overlap of your function with a squeezed coherent state. Squeezing is how big the Gaussian is. And this is uh, in phase space, though. It's the same thing. Or, alternatively, it's the Wigner function. But it's a Gaussian smooth Wigner function in phase space. Here we are, um, smooth in position and smooth in momentum by these conjugate amounts, depending on the squeezing. So three different interpretations of this rather commonly used um, representation of a function in phase space. Now, this is now never negative, but it's not band-limited, even if the function is band-limited, because of this Gaussian. So, so we've now got a function no longer band-limited. So what about the um, Husimi mean wave number? Take the Husimi function and uh, take the average, uh, fix the value of x. You're looking at local in x, but averaging it in, in k. Well, you can work, out, work it out. It's a, uh, it involves the... the, the, the um, it, it, what it involves is the local momentum. We've discussed it before, but it's now weighted with a Gaussian and with the strength of the function. So it's a kind of slightly different thing. And uh, now you ask, well, what does that do when the window width is very, very small? Well, that then just picks out the function, the value y equals x, and then you, get, um, th then you get the old value of the local wave number. So that's a slightly richer framework. So let's look at that. Let's finish by looking at that today. Once again, this same function, difference of two, uh, difference of, uh, some two plane waves traveling along with different strengths. And you can cover the, the Husimi function exactly. It's not band-limited. It depends on k, no longer discrete, as in the Wigner case. Uh, this variable k, and it depends on x. There's a k-dependent part, and there's an x-dependent part, which is oscillatory. Here it is. Uh, well, uh, it, uh, the Husimi average wave number, you can calculate it exactly by taking the local k average of this at the position x, and here it is. Um, and it's got uh, the, 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 the squeezing width is, is important there. And uh, well, here are some pictures. I've taken uh, A is 0.9. So this is the case where, where you have uh, 
um, for, the, for the local wave number, you have rather strong, thin, super oscillatory regions. But when L is 1, if it's a fairly broad squeezing, you barely, you, 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 this function is rather small. This will see me average. It's, it's close to 0. Basically, these two components almost cancel. A equals 0.1, you begin to see part of it is greater than 1. There's a super oscillatory region. L is 0 0.02, you have uh, um, these, you, you're almost approximating the local wave number with this Husimi average wave number, and everything is consistent. Here is the one, the super oscillatory region is this part in here. So, in this first talk, uh, which I've, uh, is now finished, I just gave some very elementary examples and illustrations of this concept. And the idea is that rather familiar things, interference of waves, little vortices, uh, super um, appear in rather strange forms, unfamiliar forms, if you plot the local rate of change of phase of the function, um, as opposed to the function itself, and the like. So um, that's um, what I wanted to tell you today. And I've left a little bit of time so we can have some discussion if anybody wants to. Although I will say, probably quite often, less often as these lectures proceed, I'll tell you about that next time. So, um, you know, do we have any questions? Yes. Um, in this final graph, what are you graphing there on the, on the right hand side? Those uh, are. I'm is, plotting the. That's the, okay, the, the let, average. Let me, say, let me say it, show it again. So what this is, I should have said, uh, forgive me, I, I like to label my graphs. Yes, the Husimi average wave. Oh, okay. Number. So that is using this phase space distribution, choosing an x and averaging it over k. The, val the value of k averaged for that particular value of x. And it depends on the windowing. Right. So of course, you, 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 it's all, this makes precise a familiar idea. You're looking at a bit of the function and how much of it you're looking at depends on your window. And of course, the super oscillations go away if you include too much of the function. But this is a precise way of uh, encoding that. You see, I, I wrote this little paper, a little semi, almost pedagogical paper, with Nimrod Moiseev. He's a theoretical chemist, and he said, I don't understand this, uh, how can this Fourier, local Fourier uh, 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 property being so big, how can it possibly make sense? So we understood it using these uh, Wigner functions and Husimi. And the surprise was that these rather similar functions, one is a Gaussian version, the other, give very different explanations of where the super oscillations, how they can arise. Mm -hmm. mm. You mentioned about the windowing. About? You mentioned the windowing. Yeah, this is the wind. I mean, it's a Gaussian, it's not strict wind. Just a second. Well, yes, because it's the overlap of your state with the coherent state. That's exactly what it, that's the quantum interpretation of this Rossini. So then you would say this is a better interpretation, basically better proof than Well, yes and no. Yes and no, and I'll tell you why yes. I mean this, okay, this, I have history on this thing. Um, uh, there was a time when I wrote a lot about the semi-classical asymptotics of quantum Wigner functions. So I wanted to understand, because on naively, the Wigner function is a phase space function. So it looks like a natural um, way of going from quantum to classical. It looks like, and I, I, I lost my enthusiasm, and I now call it the Wignerial disease, OK? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I worked on it for many years. Now, but then people said, why don't you look at the Husimi function, which doesn't have this disadvantage of it being negative. It's only positive. Now, here's the point, and it's a very deeply philosophical one. I'm very glad you, you asked it. If you want to understand how quantum quantities become classical when you make Planck's constant small, the Husimi function is very nice. Um, and in, in uh, it's used in, in many different examples. In quantum chaos, you look at wave functions, whatever. But if you want to understand what quantum features arising from interference survive all the way to the classical limit, if you look carefully enough, then the Wigner function is good because you don't smooth it and you see these negative regions. So when you say better, it depends 
whether you want to emphasize going to the classical limit and seeing things become classical, all super oscillations go away, or keeping an interest in those quantum features that can even survive because of interference on smaller and smaller scales, and they would only disappear if you introduce different physics like decoherence or something. So uh, it's a good question, and the answer is depends what you, what you want to use these functions, phase-based functions for. It's what's natural? Well, yes, what is natural? Uh, yes. Is that the same story? I'm not sure. Um, I think it is because you build it in. You build it in with this, um, with, with this, uh, uh, with the windowing. Because if you think of the Husserl uh, function as being, um, well, you could think of it as a coherent state. But if you think of it as being um, a Gauss smooth Wigner function, then you've built in. You've built in this uh, uncertainty because whatever you have in position, you have to put L in the other place. In, in and that's the squeezing. That's cons so it's a, it's a, it's a, the squeezing corresponds to a quantum coherent state in phase space. But you have a now. I know you do. Yeah. Well, H the H bar's gone. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it is. Of course, it's L times. It's. It is, yes. Um, uh, it is. I just didn't put the scaling in there. Um, yes, of course. And the fact that you have L on 1 over L, the product of that is the is 1, which is H bar, which I haven't included. I mean, you would have H bar on the top and H bar on the bottom for the for these different um, cases. So L is a pro really a product of position and momentum, actually. Um, so, yes, and indeed, when people started producing... Um, who see me functions, my criticism was precisely that there's an ambiguity because you've got this windowing. You could either squeeze this way or you could squeeze that way. So the whole family of them. And why do you choose this one rather than that one to represent? And the answer is, depends what you want to look at. Okay. But uh, so it's both a freedom and a disadvantage. Wigner is a kind of purer thing. But as I say, if you want to see the classical structures emerging most clearly, you use uh, use of see me. So it's... it's uh, We've been through this long ago. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Just to build on that question, um, you're mentioning the Wigner function here and the Husimi function, which yes. are two points on sort of a spectrum of these phase space distributions. Um, Wigner function's in the middle. It's the most symmetric. Yes. Husimi is at one extreme. It's the most smoothed, most nice, well behaved. But the other extreme, which is dual to the Husimi function, is the Glauber, Sudarshan, P distribution. Yeah, there are lots of them. H have you looked at the P yeah, distribution at all? Yeah, they're all much the same. All? I mean, in, in my old paper, which I don't remember clearly from 1977, I had an appendix where I looked at all different kinds of phase space functions and, uh, and concluded that for the reason things I, factors, which I was looking at, the purest and simplest, most democratic was Wigner. Then these other functions, you have ordering, different ordering possibilities, and, and they're all useful for different purposes, but from this fundamental point of view is some, somewhat artificial. So I have an append I, say, I can't remember the but I have an appendix where I list all the different properties that these different phase space functions have and Wigner came out as the one uh, the one that I uh, uh, the, that had most of the properties that you want except positivity of course which is fundamental that uh, then that tells you something. But with respect to these super oscillations yes. you're saying the Wigner function is sort of distinguished as being the most directly related. Yes because you see the negative regions exactly and I didn't and surprisingly I didn't realize that until a couple of years ago in this discussion with Nimrod, Nimrod Moiseev and that uh, so in that sense the Wigner function is very nice because uh, I mean in a sense he knew it because anyone who writes knowledge about Wigner functions says the negative parts reveal the quantumness and that quantumness is always interference of some kind, and super is extreme interference, so of course they're related. It's just sort of obvious when I say it, but it wasn't obvious, you know, till we, till we thought of it. You say it doesn't go both ways. The function is negative, doesn't mean it's super No, it doesn't, no. No, it doesn't, no, it doesn't mean that, no. But, uh, I, I mean, I, I should, in confidently saying what I've just said, I should find some simple counterexamples, and I haven't thought of it, but I, I think you're right. So on Monday, I'm going to concentrate on, uh, on optics, which is, in a sense, 
where I knew about super oscillations before I knew about them, before I realized I knew about them. But, uh, but that's become a very rich subject in its own right, and I'll tell you a story about how that happened on Monday. Okay? Yeah? Good.